All right, so for this lecture in the genetics unit, we're gonna talk about some disease examples of trinucleotide repeats. So first, just an overview of trinucleotide repeats. What it involves is that you have a three base sequence like this in, the gene, in a gene. So this would be a gene sequence. And you have a three nucleotide sequence that ends up getting repeated again and again and again and again. And this throws off the whole reading frame for a gene which as a result causes often premature termination and results in defective or even absent protein. And it's sort of similar to a frame shift mutation where a nucleotide gets inserted here and throws the whole thing off. And so by throwing off the reading sequence, you throw off expression of the gene. Now, the more repeats there are in the gene, the more severe the disease presentation will be. Again, it's shifting the reading frame even more so if you, versus if you just had one or two repeats. If you have this many where you have one, two, three, four, five repeats, that's going to throw it off even more. And these diseases also exhibit anticipation, meaning that for each successive generation, there are more repeats in the gene. So in this one, we have five. In the second generation here, we have even more repeats. And in the third generation here, we have even more repeats. And so as you can see, it gets worse with each generation. As a result of that, the disease presentation often gets worse with each generation. So these are the four main trinucleotide repeat diseases to know. We'll go through each of these. First, Fragile X syndrome. So this is a CGG repeat. So it's a repeat of these and so on. For each of these diseases, very important. You need to know these. You could get tested on these. Um, very frequently, it'll be almost a secondary type question where they'll put us in the stem. It'll have a presentation such as for Fragile X syndrome, and they'll list out repeats for different trinucleotide repeats, and they'll ask you which one is repeated in this gene sequence, and so you got to pick that out. So this is on the X chromosome, which is pretty easy to remember because of Fragile X. Now, that's important to know. It's an X-linked dominant disorder. The re this repeat occurs in the FMR1 gene. Now, this gene is required for normal development of connections between neurons, so that these patients end up presenting with neurobehavioral problems. Also, the gene is methylated, causing decreased expression as a result of these, uh, this repeat. Since it's an X-linked dominant, males will have a much more severe presentation than females will, and that's because since the mutations carried on the X chromosome, the males would have inherited the, the mutated X chromosome and they have a Y. The females will inherit one mutated X chromosome, but they'll also inherit a normal X chromosome. And since they have an, essentially an extra or a normal X chromosome as well, this helps downplay the severity of the disease. And we'll go through this inheritance pattern for X-linked dominant in much more detail in the lecture on X-linked dominant disorders. Clinical features, they have autism typically. They have very characteristic facial features. You'll often see these described in a question stem. They have a long face, long jaw, and long ears. You can see that in this picture here with this boy who has Fragile X syndrome. He has a very long ovoid face. He has larger ears, and then as you can see, he has a long jawline here. In boys, they'll also have uh, macroorchidism, which is enlarged testes. These patients can also have mitral valve prolapse and then ADHD, going back to that neurobehavioral dysfunction. Friedrich ataxia, this is a GAA repeat on chromosome 9 in the gene that encodes the Frataxin gene. Now, the Frataxin gene is involved in mitochondrial function and iron binding, and it's mainly involved in iron transport in, within the electron transport chain within the mito that occurs in the mitochondria, which is obviously important for ATP production. And as, of a, as a side note, this isn't terribly high yield, but these patients will have iron overload in the mitochondria, and that results in increased reactive oxygen species, which, as you know, cause significant damage to cells and then affect the electron transport chain's ability to produce ATP, which affects energy production. And one of the main effects of this disease is felt in neurons, specifically in the spinal cord, which is where a lot of the famous symptoms for this disease happen, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Just real quick, the mode of inheritance. Remember, for all of these diseases, it's really important to know the mode of inheritance. It could be on a test. It's autosomal recessive. So spinal cord degeneration is a hallmark of this disease. These patients typically t present with difficulty in walking, loss of sensation in the extremities, and that gets worse as the disease progresses. One thing I forgot to mention is these patients typically present with this disease between the ages of 5 and 15. And here in the spinal cord, it affects mainly the dorsal column and the cortical spinal tract. So the dorsal column carries neurons that are part of the sensory tracts, and you can see that here. Here's the dorsal column. And they're mainly responsible for 
proprioception, detection of light touch, sensation, and so as a result of that, these patients will have decreased deep tendon reflexes, decreased sensation of vibration, position, and touch. And then since the corticospinal tract is affected, they'll also present with weakness. And here's the corticospinal tract as well. Clinical features as a result of that spinal cord degeneration, you have falls, ataxic gait, nystagmus, dysarthria. Often these patients can have diabetes mellitus and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They can also present with these musculoskeletal defects, kyphoscoliosis, pes cavus, hammer toes, and then unfortunately, they have premature death. So Huntington's disease, this is a result of a CAG repeat on chromosome 4, which results in a mutated Huntington protein. Now, I'm not going to get into the complex neuroscience of the pathways involved here. That's beyond the scope of a biochemistry lecture. However, what I will tell you, though, is that in these patients, there's an abnormally elevated amount of dopamine. And what that results in is decreased GABA, which is a inhibitory neurotransmitter, and then decreased acetylcholine, specifically in the caudate nucleus. And the caudate, along with the putamen, is part of the basal ganglia, which is a region in the brain that regulates movement. And so without this, due to decrease of these inhibitory neurotransmitters, these patients develop the characteristic choreiform movements, which is where they have uncontrolled flailing of the extremities, other uncontrolled movements. And so it's very unfortunate these patients have very little executive control over the movement, movements within their body. The other thing to make a note of is that they have glutamate toxicity via NMDA receptor overexcitation, and this causes a death of motor neurons. And so that also contributes to some of the symptoms that are seen in, this pa in these patients. Mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant. What ends up happening is these patients have degeneration of the caudate and the putamen, which as we said are the, essentially the motor centers. They regulate motor function. So here over here, we'll, this is a coronal section of the brain, just to give you an idea of where these structures are located. You have the caudate nucleus, which is shown here, just lateral to the lateral ventricle. And then you have the putamen here, which is down here. And these structures undergo degeneration as a result of these pathological processes going on in Huntington's disease. As a result of degeneration, and this can happen in many diseases such as Alzheimer's or dementia even, is, is you have patients that have decreased cortical tissue or tissue surrounding these lateral ventricles, and then they actually expand out. And that's what's called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. And you actually can see this on neuroimaging. This disease starts between ages 20 and 40. So clinical features, again, are those signature choreiform movements, which is essentially loss of motor control because when you have degeneration of these structures, you're losing that GABA output to control certain areas and inhibit uh, motor function and motor movement. These patients also develop aggression, depression, dementia, cognitive impairment as a result of this. And then they can also present with hyperreflexia, dystonia, dysphagia. And unfortunately, this disease leads to premature death. Myotonic dystrophy, this is due to a CTG repeat on the DMPK gene, which alters the expression of the myotonin protein kinase. The exact function of this protein is not entirely known, but what is known is that it's critical for muscle function, which is why it leads to this form of muscular dystrophy. Now, we're going to talk in much more detail about this particular disease in Chapter 43, which is the muscular dystrophy chapter where in that lecture we'll talk about all the forms of muscular dystrophy in much more detail. We're just going to bring it up here briefly, just because it's an example of a trinucleotide repeat, talk about some of the high yield features, but again we'll go in more detail in chapter 43. Mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant, and then the clinical features are the cataracts, myotonia. A hallmark example in this disease is difficulty releasing a handshake. Again, this all ties back to this impact on muscular function as a result of this mutation. Muscle wasting hair balding, arrhythmia, and testicular atrophy. All right, so that closes out our discussion of trinucleotide repeats.